Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, kick it off with uh, uh, an, an observation and maybe a, 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 a comment from uh, Ambassador Mabubani on the fact that he uh, mentioned that we are in an era where official external conflict or wars are, are mercifully very, very rare in today's world. Uh, question to you, sir, is uh, what is the prospect that internal conflicts, low-intensity internal civil war type conflicts, will become at the predominant 21st century manifestation of external officially declared wars? Because if I look at India uh, or even South Asia as a, as a microcosm, uh, we, are, you know, we have several internal conflicts which are, look very worrying to us, and that's true in many other parts of the world. So will internal war become the substitute for official externally declared wars in the 21st century? That was my observation and question to you, sir. And uh, uh, Dr. Cohen, you mentioned the role of uh, information technology, television, SMS, and others as a weapon or a means of, uh, of revolutionizing information flow. But how do you see this sort of almost public uh, debate and, and instantaneous feedback and, and amateur uh, diplomacy, if you will, affecting foreign policy and strategy itself. Uh, will foreign policy experts and strategists be influenced by this incessant barrage of information that all of us are subjected to, and will that actually affect carefully considered policy as it goes forward? So I'd like to each of you to uh, react to these questions. We have a huge stack of questions from the audience to follow, but I just wanted to kick it off with these two questions. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Professor uh, Mehbuban is audio. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. Yeah, before, good, this works. <laughs> IIT technology comes through always. <laughs> uh, before we go on to discuss the, the danger of internal conflicts, which I agree with you, by the way, it's, it's a problem and challenge. Yeah? Let us spend a moment celebrating the fact <laughs> that the prospect of interstate wars huh, is diminishing year by year. And you know, there have been some remarkable developments in the world that people have not noticed, by the way. I mean, I'll give you one example. At the end of the Cold War, when you, if you had, had to make a prediction, where would war break out? In the Balkans of Europe or in the Balkans of Asia, right, in 1990? Everybody would have said, hey, war is more likely in the Balkans of Asia. And the Balkans of Asia, by the way, is Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia has more diversity of race, language, religion, culture, history, you name it, than the Balkans of Europe. And remarkably enough, the Balkans of Asia, Southeast Asia, has been at peace. Now this is a remarkable development. And even in the height of the Asian financial crisis, when everyone expected problems in Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia sailed through it. And in contrast, by the way, in the 1990s, the most vicious wars were fought in the Balkans of Europe, between Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, you name it. And that remarkable development is something that we need to reflect on and ask why it has happened. And the reason why it has happened is because of something called the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, which has done a remarkable job. And sometimes when people ask me, why has ASEAN kept peace in Southeast Asia? I give a serious answer. And my serious answer is that ASEAN is at peace because of a four-letter word. And the four-letter word is golf. Because the ministers, permanent secretaries, and chiefs of army, and chiefs of navy, have been so busy playing golf and betting with each other that they have no time to make war. And, and this is actually a, a serious comment because I personally participated in these golf games. 
And I know what a difference it made. In the beginning we would have an official meeting, we would sit down with each other and argue with each other. But after a golf game, we come back, we have a beer, and I'll tell my ASEAN counterparts, I just say, shut up, let's agree, you know, no time, let's proceed. You can do that after a golf game. And I, the reason why this is serious is that if you can do that in other parts of the world, if you can do that in South Asia, and get the ministers and the permanent secretaries and the chiefs of army to go around golfing with each other, can you imagine how much more stable this would be? So please promote golf. <laughs> now, let me turn to the question of internal conflicts. And sadly, uh, internal conflicts will rise. Partly, you know, it's a, there's a sort of correlation down there. Countries will have to focus on the internal problems. And here, fortunately, the answer again is modernization and growth. Because with modernization and growth, the prospects of internal conflict also go down. That's why you notice in the parts of the world where they're less developed, like the parts of Africa that are less developed, you have a rise in internal conflicts. By contrast, again, if you look at a, one of the most long-standing conflicts in Southeast Asia, by the way, which no one thought we solve in our lifetime, which would be very difficult, very painful, was a conflict called Aceh in northern Sumatra. They've been fighting for 40 years. And now guess what? After the tsunami, through some miracle, through some ex exceptional political leadership by President SBY of Indonesia and Vice President Yusuf Kala of Indonesia, there was peace in Aceh. So you can see that in the, even in the intractable conflicts that people think, hey, you cannot find a solution to them, you can you can in this world of today do it. And so my, my, my message to you ultimately is an optimistic one. If you really focus on it, have the right policies, you can solve most of these problems. I would just agree, I would certainly agree with that response and add a uh, comment to my own um, uh, um, well, let me answer, let me respond to the question. Um, like all of you, I'm on the, on the web or on the net or on my Blackberry all the time. But my wife looks at me and says, you know, more is not better and faster is not better. And I was re I'm reminded occasionally of this, what P.V. Narasimha Rao told me once. He said, most decisions can be deferred. If you just wait a couple of days, <laughs> or as, or as comrades, comrades used to say, I guess in Tamil, Park alone, you know, just, you know. So I, so I, 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 I think that, I think that we're driven, we're driven, we're driven in part by the need of the media to get a news story out every 10 minutes. And I find that irritating but necessary. And uh, as one who's wired up and two sons of mine are in, the, in, this, in this business, so I can't be critical, but I think that, uh, need to take a deep breath once in a while, turn ourselves off, and in a sense, uh, go away from the computer and, and, the, and the internet. So I think it's been a problem, but it's that, that kind of problem can be dealt with. What is more difficult and more frightening is that not only are the good guys and, and ladies using it, but this is an important instrument for a lot of radicals of all kinds, whether they're, you name the religion and, and the radical elements in it, and, and they use this, and they, inter, and they connect and so forth. And that's a negative problem, uh, negative aspect of the technology. So I, my own view is that uh, turn off the Blackberry from time to time, go on vacation. I, I can't do it myself, to be honest. I, I'm, I'm hooked. But um, I think, you know, but patience, wait, and don't assume that all problems can be solved quickly or ha have solutions. <laughs>